Do intercooler expansion takes make a difference? Stick around, we're gonna find out. What is going on everybody? Welcome back to the garage and we have installed one of these Weapon X intercooler expansion tanks and I'll be honest with you. First, let me say, yeah, they make a difference whenever you're at the track and you drain water off and you pour ice in. But my question was, does it make a difference in day-to-day -day driving? Are you going to see a drop in manifold air temps? And so what I did was go out before I installed this warm everything up, then got to a location and just let it idle and heat soak. So I did that for about five, six minutes to see what kind of temps that we were seeing. In particular, I was looking at the IAT temp versus the manifold temp. As we saw the IATs go up, we also see the manifold air temp go up and they were trending quite a bit higher. My question was if I installed this, filled it up, went out and did the same thing with the same ambient temperature, you know, plus or minus a degree or two, whether or not we would see cooler manifold air temps versus IATs. So let's jump over to the laptop, take a look at the data logs and see what the data tells us. Okay, I've got both windows opened up here. The bottom one is our first one without the expansion tank. The top one is going to be with the expansion tank, and we're particularly fond of these values right here. And we're looking for a specific area in the log where the data kind of matches up as far as intake air temp. And you can see towards the end is where we did our heat soak stuff. And if we scroll through here, we're seeing IATs get up to 125, 130, and we got a manifold air temp of 164. So we're looking at 35 degrees over without that uh, expansion tank in here. If we scroll through this one, IATs are quite a bit lower. Uh, even though the ambient air temp was the same, two degrees off, we'll call it the same. Uh, you know, I didn't get this one out on the highway and that probably had something to do with some of that. But let's do a comparison here. And in particular, let's find an area where we're at 100 IAT on our first one and look at our temp differences. And we're right about there. Let me scroll over. So you can see right now that we're at 100 with 159 degrees manifold air temp of heat soak. Whereas up here, we're at 100 with 146. So that's 13 degrees of difference right there. So if we scroll down through here and find a hotter spot, see if we get our IATs up to say 110 before I shut it off. 109 right at the end and we are looking at a manifold air temp of 149. And as you can see, we're at a 111, let me drop this down. Oh, there it was, 109. Get there, get there, get there. Close enough, we'll say. We're looking at 149 versus 161. Still a 12 degree, so we went 13, 12 degree difference. Now, that all being said, if we were to run this thing out longer, yeah, maybe it's going to eventually start catching up and heat soaking more and more to the point where these fall in line. But right now, after a solid 17 minute drive or so, yeah, 17 minute drive, IAT, our manifold air temps were 10 degrees cooler just by adding an expansion tank, which is very interesting, especially if you give into consideration that uh, whenever we ran the logs with the expansion tank on there, the ambient air was two degrees warmer than it was beforehand. So very interesting data there, because even if you look early on in the pre-expansion stuff, our IATs, our manifold air temps get up to 130 real quick and stay in that 130, 140 range. We have an IAT of 82 and we're pushing 140 degrees. If I try and find an IAT in here of about the same. And this is whenever we're heat soaking. So this has got more engine going into it. So it lines up there, 
but it seems to be whenever it gets kind of past that point, that extended uh, volume in that expansion tank, on top of it being black, which helps it wick heat out of the fluid, so you have more water, uh, so it's actually cycling more volume through, giving the uh, heat exchanger more time to pull air, well, not necessarily more time, it's the same amount of air, but it's taking it, pulling the heat out before it pushes it back through the supercharger and heating it up, and then that stuff loiters in that expansion tank for a while, diffuses a little bit of heat, and so we're just not heat cycling the same volume of water at the same uh, quickness that we were before the expansion tank. So I was rather surprised. I honestly did not think it would make any difference whatsoever. I thought as soon as that thing was running, as soon as the temperature of the supercharger got up, that it would all equal out in the system. And the only place that you would see cooler water, obviously, is after the outlet of the uh, heat exchanger. But this tends to show me that if the heat exchanger is allowed to do a better job because the water being pulled into the heat exchanger may be cooled off a little bit due to the volume. Now, granted, if we put ice in this thing, we're going to see, uh, you know, below ambient temperatures until the ice melts. That's the nice thing about these things. You grab a bag of ice, go down to the drag strip, pour it full of ice, and you get a lot of power on it. But the big question was, was it worth doing for daily driving? And I think it actually was, because whenever it comes to a supercharged car like this, you're talking about how much timing it's going to be pulling out because of manifold air temperature or intake air temperatures and things like that. If you can reduce those temperatures, it's going to pull less time and you're going to make more power and so that's why a supercharged or turbocharged setup is critical to have as much cooling efficiency as possible on your charge air. So hopefully this helps some of you guys out to decide whether or not you need to upgrade some of your cooling systems. Uh, if you have any questions, hit up the comments down below. And as always, thanks for stopping by the garage. Remember, ABT, always be tuning.